Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Churchill Fellowship information session. Uh, the focus topic for this session is environment and climate change. My name is Adam Davey. I'm CEO of the Winston Churchill Trust, and I'm uh, presenting to you here from Canberra, Ngunnawal country. Um, I'm going to begin this information session uh, with an overview of what Churchill Fellowships are all about, um, how you apply and the sorts of things that we're looking for. Um, I would like to acknowledge Australia's First Nations people, um, the traditional custodians of this land, uh, and, and acknowledge um, all the, the places that you are tuning in from today and pay my respects to Elders uh, past, present and future. Um, welcome to any Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people who have tuned in. Um, we, we've got a new uh, Indigenous Churchill Fellows Network that started up and, and that's uh, going great guns. And I thought I'd mention that because we are encouraging um, yeah, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people not only to apply, but to engage with our network. And in fact, there's an information session um, on Monday uh, evening as well. Uh, you can tune into that if you're interested. A um, little bit of housekeeping, uh, you'll be able to submit your questions via the Q&A in the chat function. So you will see the questions that other people have put up, so we, you don't have to duplicate them. If you miss your chance or you think of something after the event's over, uh, you can contact us directly uh, via our website or you can call the office. We're happy to talk to you and answer your questions um, pretty much at any time during office hours. Um, also, you can tune in to another session um, on a different uh, theme if you want to and we're hoping to do some perhaps Facebook live kind of question and answer sessions in a couple of weeks as well. So lots of opportunities to answer your questions. Uh, we've got two speakers today, uh, Taryn Lane um, and Scott Falcon are both Churchill Fellows from Victoria and you'll get to meet them shortly. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the very difficult times that uh, we've been living through um, with the COVID pandemic, um, both here uh, and globally. Uh, there's been a lot of disruption and uncertainty. Um, of course, the, the recent floods have been absolutely um, terrible. Uh, I think, you know, uh, environment and climate change is just increasingly becoming uh, a salient and important issue. And the role that Churchill Fellowships can play in helping Australia address that, I think can't be um, overstated. So I'll start uh, my slide presentation now. And um, one of the questions that I'm often asked about Churchill Fellowships is, you know, where does the money come from? And I think it's important to understand the history um, or the origins of Churchill Fellowships. So obviously, uh, Sir Winston Churchill uh, is, is the person that the fellowships are in honour of. And when Winston Churchill resigned as British Prime Minister in 1955 at the age of 80, he'd served under five reigning monarchs and he'd survived uh, three wars. He'd been a writer, a painter, an historian, a journalist, an adventurer, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953. So as you can imagine, there was a widespread desire to honour Sir Winston Churchill and capture the essence of his public service, uh, his inspiration, his intellect, uh, and you know, his humour for generations to come. He wasn't perfect, and you can read some insightful essays on our website that explore Sir Winston through a contemporary lens. But he was someone who readily believed that anything was possible if he put your mind to it, and that the greatest figures in history were those who made a contribution to public service and to their fellow countrymen. So when the Prime Minister at the time, Sir Robert Menzies, announced uh, Sir Winston's death in January 1965, he simultaneously announced a national fundraising appeal, a door knock appeal, and over 220,000 Australians supported by the RSL uh, participated in that single day door knock appeal and combined with the generosity of businesses and government contributions, uh, about 2.2 million pounds or around three, uh, four million dollars uh, equivalent was raised. And that, that's the seed funding for Churchill Fellowships, which has been carefully invested and, and grown uh, through bequests and then donations. Uh, to fund over 100 fellowships each year um, today. So that's, that's a little story about where the funds uh, come from. And uh, the other question I get asked is, you know, what are the attributes of a Churchill Fellow? You know, what makes a Churchill Fellow? And I think 
you know, Churchill Fellows are the types of people who are absolutely passionate uh, about and committed to an issue or, or, a, or a particular, you know, topic or a field. Um, and they want to learn and share that knowledge with others in their community uh, so that their communities might benefit. So I think in a nutshell, you know, trying to make Australia better through their own contribution. Now, a Churchill Fellowship, it's, it's really unique. It's, it's a prestigious opportunity that's open to Australians from all walks of life. So it's not an academic scholarship. And in fact, you don't have any uh, prerequisites in terms of academic study um, to apply for a Churchill Fellowship. Uh, it's also not a funding grant. It's, it's a very empowering uh, thing to be awarded a Churchill Fellowship. Um, and I'll talk about this in a moment, but effectively, you know, you're given a lot more freedom to do your thing. Um, and we don't ask you to acquit every cent um, of, of the fellowship, it's, it's, it's much more empowering. The fellowships, it's not just an overseas trip, it's really the start of a, a often lifelong journey uh, for you to make your contribution to make Australia better. Now, a Churchill Fellowship doesn't need to comprise uh, formal research, you know, it can, but you can learn new skills, undertake a course, um, you can build networks, you can observe best practice in your chosen field. And you can choose the way in which uh, you acquire that information and that knowledge and those skills. A fellowship is for overseas travel and it must be for between four to eight weeks and taken in one continuous um, journey. We've awarded over uh, 4,400 fellowships since 1966. And each year there are typically more than 100 uh, fellowships awarded in Australia from each state and territory. Churchill Fellows travel across, across the globe on the widest range and depth of topics. It's, it's really amazing. And, and they bring back to this country information, you know, networks, projects, uh, products, ideas, innovation, all things that can help make Australia stronger. So to be eligible, you need to be an Australian citizen um, or as of this year, we've made some changes and permanent residents may now apply. You need to be over the 18, 18 years of age at the uh, closing date. And the ability to travel overseas is um, essential. So um, we have been getting some questions uh, like, do I need to be vaccinated against COVID? Um, well, we don't put in place requirements for vaccination, but if you want to travel overseas, and they have requirements such as being vaccinated against COVID, then you, you are expected to uh, comply with those requirements. Because if you can't travel overseas um, on the fellowship, then largely you won't be able to do it. That said, um, if you need support, you might have a disability, for example, um, then we can provide some support and that might be support for a carer to go with you, for example. And we've also now introduced the option for people who are unable to travel overseas uh, due to a disability or caring responsibilities uh, to undertake their uh, church or fellowship using virtual research. So this, this type of technology we're using now. Um, so I think that that's pretty exciting and helps open the doors to even more people to, um, to undertake a church or fellowship. Uh, also for people living in remote parts of Australia, we will be allowing domestic travel soon. So if that's you, um, well done on your internet working, uh, but also please get in touch with us because we'd love to discuss that, that exciting opportunity with you. Now, Churchill Fellowship is an individual project. It's not a team project. So sometimes we get asked uh, by potential applicants, can we apply for a Churchill Fellowship? My team wants to apply. And the answer is no, it's for an individual. So there can only be one Churchill Fellow. That said, you may take someone uh, with you on your fellowship if you want. And uh, I think you might hear from um, Scott today. He's a great example where his employer supported uh, uh, an Indigenous employee to travel with him on his fellowship. Um, it was very relevant to the topic. And I think uh, he would agree that it made it a, a better thing overall. So there is some flexibility there, but, but a team cannot apply. Um, if you're undertaking tertiary studies, that's okay, but you can't uh, apply for a church or fellowship where your project forms part of that study that you're doing. Um, we expect you to commit 100% to your church or fellowship. Uh, we don't really want to see you splitting your time across 
your Cheshire Fellowship and your studies um, because that won't do justice to your fellowship. So I think I want you to hear that a church of fellowship is an opportunity for people from all walks of life. And that's um, something, a saying, a statement that we hear bandied around a lot. But for us, it's our mantra. It's core to what church of fellowships are all about. Now, another question we get is, you know, well, is my project um, suitable or eligible? And I think, you know, uh, most times they are. Uh, of course, your project, you must be able to articulate or explain how your gaining of this new knowledge or skills from around the world and bringing it back to share it in Australia will benefit the Australian community in some way. It can benefit you personally, that's fine, but it must benefit the Australian community. Uh, you do need to demonstrate that you've you know, fully explored your topic, your issue within Australia, um, because we don't want to send you overseas to learn something you could have learnt within Australia. That, that defeats the purpose or the point of church or fellowships. And as I mentioned, uh, your project has to be a self-contained project, not part of a, uh, a PhD or a master's. Um, it, it can't also be partly funded by another organisation. So again, you know, a church or fellowship is a, is a thing in and of itself. Um, so if you've got another organisation that's, that's doing work on a particular project and, you know, they see a church or fellowship as being an opportunity to pay for some overseas travel to allow you to do that. That's not really what a church or fellowship is, is intended to do. So it doesn't need to relate to your employment. Um, quite often people apply for a church or fellowship on a topic and they are working in that field and it's quite relevant to their employer and that, that's fantastic, um, but, but it doesn't have to be. So some people don't realize that, but um, you might have a passion and, and dedicate yourself to something outside of your working life that, uh, that is also suitable for a church or fellowship. So we don't set limits on the topics. Literally, it can be um, your project can be on any topic or issue that you can think of that has relevance in Australia. And obviously, there's benefits to going overseas uh, to bring back that knowledge. So you really do uh, design your own project. And as I said earlier, you know it's a bit different to a to a grant. Um, you know, we we fund the the travel, we fund your um, living allowance for, for food and for accommodation um, and those sorts of things. Uh, your insurance is covered. So it's a fully you know, financially supported project for you to go off and do it. We don't you know, follow you every step of the way, you know, telling you what to do. You go off and do what you said you'd do. So your job is to convince us um, about your project. We do have uh, some sponsored church or fellowships uh, on particular topics, and that might be through a bequest, um, someone's you know, left their um, amount of money for the trust to um, award fellowships on a topic that they are committed to. Um, we've got uh, individuals and uh, businesses and government departments who also sponsor church or fellowships. They, will, they want them to be uh, researched on a particular topic. Um, so in, in, I guess, relevance to this particular session today, some that come to mind are the um, Lord Mayor's bushfire appeal, um, there's the Duke Bob and June uh, Prickett uh, Churchill Fellowship on Natural Disasters. So there's a whole list of them um, on our website. When you fill out the application form, you'll have a drop down menu and you can select one or two uh, sponsor fellowships where you think your project really aligns with what they're looking for. That can confuse people. So I just want to make it clear you don't need to select a sponsor fellowship. If you don't select one and we see that your project's aligned, we can, um, we can align it and we can award it to you um, anyway. Um, if you do select sponsor fellowships, it won't disadvantage you and be considered for a church or fellowship more broadly. Really, it just helps us you know, um, award fellowships to those sponsor fellowships because we have better visibility of them. So I wouldn't spend too much time being concerned about that. Uh, so obviously, uh, you apply online. Uh, we've got a uh, application form that you can log into and log out of to your heart's content. Um, so you can go in. Uh, my advice is go in uh, as soon as you can, uh, open up an account, start the application process. There's a, there's a uh, apply button on our website to let you do that. Um, you'll be able to you know, start thinking about the kinds of questions we're asking and how to formulate or write your, uh, your application. Church of Fellows you know, always tell us that the process of writing it um, helps them um, distill and refine their thinking 
about their project. So, so get in early is my advice. Um, you will be competing against every other applicant. And, you know, in a typical year, and certainly I would say it's not a typical year now, coming off the back of a pandemic. Um, but what I would say is we typically would get around 1,000 to 1,100 applications. And as I said, we award around 100 each year. So yeah, I think the odds are reasonably good, but they're also it's very competitive. So you, know, you need to think about how you convince the selection committee um, about you know, your project being important and why you're the person to do it. You are going to need two references, someone who can vouch for you, your, you know, your um, aptitude, your, your personal traits, and someone who can um, vouch for your project and has some credibility or experience in that particular field or, or topic or area. So again, the advice there is get in early, identify those referees, check that they're happy to be a referee. They're going to be available over the next few weeks uh, so that they can um, fill out your reference. Um, it's always the number one problem on the closing date, which is the 28th of April this year. People ring up and say, oh my gosh, my referee hasn't done my reference. Um, we can't extend the deadline, so you need to make sure that they're uh, ready to go. Um, the form, as I said, is fully automated, so you, you won't be able to submit it until you've got all the information, including your references in there. Uh, do not leave it to the last minute. I think I'm, I'm probably pushing that point, but it's important. Don't wait to the last minute to start your application because it won't be your best application. Um, you know, people have started the applications now, and I would recommend getting in there and having a look. Some, some things to think about um, your itinerary. So in your application, you will be effectively asked um, how long uh, do you want to travel overseas for? Uh, which countries do you want to go to? Which cities do you want to go to? Which people or organisations do you want to meet with? And how long will you be there? So, you know, for example, it might be I want to go to um, New York for um, one week. I want to meet with organisation A, B and C. And I want to, um, you know, conduct interviews with them or I want to undertake a course, or, you know, to do this or that. Um, and that's the kind of information we need um, you to flesh out. You don't need to have contacted those organisations or people, but you do need to understand, you know, why you want to meet with them and what you want to do there and why they're important. Um, it's good to get a sense of if they will accept um, international visitors, but you don't need to have contacted them and locked it in. You'll have time to do that um, once you're awarded your fellowship. So keep that in mind. Um, don't uh, be overly ambitious in terms of how many places you can visit in four to eight weeks. Um, it's tempting to, to um, put in a massive itinerary and travel plan, but um, two things. Firstly, you will miss out on opportunities um, for meetings that you don't even know you're going to have yet because that invariably happens. When you're overseas meeting with people, they'll say, oh, why don't you uh, meet with this person uh, you know, uh, the day after tomorrow. And if you're saying, oh, oh sorry, I've got to leave. I'm, I'm on a really tight schedule. You'll miss those opportunities. And also, we don't want you to burn out. We want you to uh, take the opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, absorb the, the environment, the culture that you're in and understand more about what they do in those countries. And, and you need to have breaks, um, have a weekend, be a bit of a tourist, you know, those sorts of things. So you need to um, get the most out of the experience. So don't be overly ambitious and put in, you know, you're going to visit 12 countries in four weeks because that, that's just not going to be achievable. Um, so, you know, COVID has, you know, put a, a stop to international travel for the last couple of years. Thankfully, it has um, opened up again and we have Churchill Fellows now travelling around the world, which is amazing. And we've got more and more coming. We did have um, around 200 Churchill Fellows who haven't been able to travel um, internationally. So that's pretty exciting. We do have travel insurance now that will form part of the fellowship opportunity. In terms of the selection process, um, we have panels and committees in each state and territory comprising people from a range of different fields and sectors. So applications will be shortlisted in the state or territory where you live. Um, you may be in, uh, asked to an interview um, if you're shortlisted. And then um, once those committees have come up with their recommendations, our board will make a decision in September on the final um, uh, award of Church of Fellowships for the year. So it is a competitive process. Uh, keep that in mind. Um, 
also keep in mind that uh, the members of the selection panels committees may not be experts in your particular field or your particular issue. Um, so, you know, don't use jargon, uh, use plain English, be compelling, be succinct. Um, assume they don't know all the details of what you're talking about. I think that that's quite important and try and put it into simple everyday language that people will understand. And, and, you know, if you can build that burning platform, you know, why is this so important? Why is it important that you do it? Why is it important that you travel um, soon, you know, to, to undertake this work? And what will that benefit be um, to Australia? Um, so look, don't be shy. That's another piece of good advice. You know, if you're here, you're thinking about this opportunity, um, there's every chance that, you know, you could be successful in, in getting a Churchill Fellowship. So it's not the time to be shy. It's the time to make your application stand out and, um, you know, put your conviction down in the application. Um, so on that note, uh, this slide here, you can see has our office number and our website address, both very useful for you if you're applying. Um, I'm now going to um, finish up. We'll answer all the questions um, at the end um, of our speaker session today. So our first um, speaker who I'm going to introduce is Taryn Lane. And while she introduces herself, I'm gonna bring up her slides. Hi everyone. Um, I can see there's quite a lot of people here, but I can't see your faces, unfortunately. So my name is Taryn Lane. I'm the general manager at Hepburn Wind, which uh, is a community-owned wind farm in central Victoria. Uh, and I am a 2016 Churchill Fellow and was lucky enough to travel in, in 2017 before you know, all the worldly events occurred. Um, okay, great. Got my slides up. I'll jump to the next one. Thanks, Adam. So in 2017, I went to uh, Europe um, and I was really looking at uh, what makes a system, both on a kind of a, a village level as well as a municipality or local government level and then a regional level of how um, European villages were transitioning um, to 100% renewable and zero net energy. Zero net energy meaning they're also looking at, at um, transport and, and heat as well as electricity. Um, in, in our community's experience, we uh, were the first example of a 100% of renewable village with the wind farm in Dalesford, but it was very much a project, um, an isolated project, and, and I wanted to think more holistically about how we could take um, not just our town, but our entire shire um, to a, a greater goal, essentially. So I was lucky enough to, to travel through Europe. There's, there's a very small map there of all the, the many sites that I went to, but primarily I was in uh, Germany, Denmark. Um, I went up to Norway, Austria as well. Uh, and I spoke to 80 thought leaders, visited 20 villages that, that had um, already met this goal or almost met this goal, five cities. I visited around 70 projects and uh, also presented at five conferences. And that's probably something that, uh, to, to know also comes out of it is when people hear that you're coming, um, they also want to hear about your experience um, from Australia as well. So I was asked to present it at several conferences. Next slide. So really what I was trying to unpack was um, how lighthouse communities, so com communities showing a lot of leadership in regards to climate um, action, we're going beyond 100% renewable and uh, you know, what became very clear was the real need to focus on not just 100% renewable or, or zero net energy, but to really focus on zero net emissions um, as, as, the, as the fastest track to start having the, the, you know, the tricky conversations that we need to have about things outside of electricity that are also contributing to our emissions. Next slide. So on my return, um, I was you know, lucky enough to directly apply a lot of the learnings that came out of the Churchill experience. Um, part of that was, was applying to get some funding to essentially um, pilot what a community-led climate transition could be um, to zero net emissions and create a, a model that other communities could, could replicate. Uh, and to do that, we you know, had, a, had an amazing team um, that, that came together and we used a template um, from another community that was based on zero net energy and, and essentially, I guess, sort of supersized it um, to, to deal with zero net emissions. 
So we, we did a, a community-based plan. We, we worked, you know, in my community to have a sorts of community ideas and, um, you know, did a, did a carbon footprint and, a, and, a mod, and the modelling for how we, we would reach our goal, which was, 20, you know, zero net emissions by 2030. Uh, and we launched um, essentially the master plan and, and what our program of works was going to be in 2019. Uh, we were also awarded the Premier Sustainability Award that year for, for our project, which was fantastic. And since then, we've just been deploying a whole bunch of community programs. So lots of bulk buys in particular. So we've been doing heat pump bulk buy, solar and battery bulk buy, and electric vehicle bulk buy, um, as well as EV charging infrastructure, energy efficiency audits and projects, um, agroforestry projects, and a, a lot of engagement in the agricultural sector, which is our biggest um, local emissions uh, area. And we've seen, uh, you know, I guess real proof in, in what we're what our approach is. We've seen uh, it's getting pretty close to $5 million of, of local spend on, on these community plans um, and programs already since 2019. And that's a tremendous amount of money for a community, a rural, small rural community of 15,000 people. Uh, this year, we just completed our energy, our electricity audit, and we're currently at 42% renewable consumption, which is well above the state average of 30%. And uh, Hepburn Wind, for example, is, is also developing a solar and battery um, farm to be co-located up at the wind farm. I was also lucky enough last year to participate um, in, a, in another program that the Churchill Trust has, which uh, is called the Policy Impact Program, which, which they piloted last year. And it was really fantastic. It was so great for, uh, as an alumni, to have the opportunity and support to, to expand our impact. So uh, essentially, it was, uh, you know, we created articles with support from, from um, practitioners from the Trust, but also the University of Queensland to, to make recommendations about the types of policy settings that we need on a local, state and national level to really unlock um, the, the types of um, programs and projects that, that we see as being beneficial. So um, both myself and Scott were, were lucky to participate in that. And it, look, it really helped um, build awareness, I would say sectoral awareness, and it really helped uh, me also refine some of the policy gaps that, that we have that we really need to see into the future. Great. Uh, so a couple of highlights and some advice. Uh, and I guess these are kind of a bit, bit abstract, maybe my highlights rather than sort of telling you a story of my experience. But what I still remember now, um, you know, several years later is, is the warmth and the welcome of like-minded people, the amount of people that refused to let me stay in a hotel and made me come over for dinner and, uh, you know, really, really welcomed me in was, was kind of remarkable. Um, and also, you know, just the privilege of having the space to reflect and think more broadly. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are like me, where, where we work hard, we're very kind of project focused and, and getting a project done. And often you don't have that sort of parallel experience of really getting to, to think through and, and lift your gaze a little bit. So it's a really fantastic opportunity for that. Um, I think Adam touched on this earlier as well, but, you know, I, I really allowed uh, a bit of space and a bit of flex for spontaneous the spontaneity uh, and that was wonderful because so many people had all these other great people who were up the road or you know in the town who they wanted me to meet and they just needed several more hours or an extra day for, for us to kind of get together and um, yeah so I, re I really support uh, allowing that flex and just the, the other fellows amazing people um, I've had a couple of experiences now through also the policy impact program to really experience the other other fellows some of my advice for applying would be to really lean into your niche. This is all about the celebration of niches. Um, it's an amazing opportunity um, for people who, who, yeah, are deeply engaged in a certain to topic. And to contact, you know, some of your key focus organisations and people first, um, because they'll always have recommendations of where, where else you should go. In regards to time and commitment, um, again, as Adam said, just be really careful that you don't burn out, do what's, what's appropriate for your lifestyle and, um, and the pace. Uh, but make sure the notes you take are really good and every night make sure that they're all in order because, uh, yeah, the report writing uh, is, is made a lot easier through that process. And I think my, my report took a couple of weeks to, to finalise. Great, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Adam.
Excellent. Thank you, Taryn. That, that was fantastic. And um, uh, I'll move on. I know it's uh, people's lunchtime. So, uh, Scott, I'll let you introduce yourself or I bring up your slides. Uh, thanks a lot, Adam, and um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Scott Falconer. I'm um, a Deputy Chief Fire Officer with uh, Forest Fire Management Victoria uh, in, um, stationed in Bendigo. Um, I, I was a 20, awarded a 2017 fellowship um, and travelled in 2018. So um, not far behind Taryn and um, I got the Lord uh, Mayor's Bushfire Appeal Churchill Fellowship um, to investigate how to create partnerships with traditional owners with a particular focus on enabling the reintroduction of cultural burning practices. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and at the time, I was just ahead of a curve before the 2020 Black Summer fires. So um, I couldn't have picked my timing um, better in terms of this issue becoming very um, prominent at a, on a national um, stage. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, I traveled uh, in the United States from Florida right up to Canada at uh, Fort McMurray where it's, you know, it gets dark at about 11 p.m. Um, it really was some of the advice that you've just heard about, don't, don't um, overcommit, I overcommitted. I had seven and a half weeks to do that, didn't look like a lot, but the amount of travel, I only had a few days off during that period. Um, so one of my upfront tips is, really be mindful of how you plan your trip if you're successful. Um, uh, three highlights for me. Um, next slide, please. Um, the first one I've listed is uh, traveling with Trent Nelson, who's there on the right with Amy Christensen. They're both traditional owners. Trent's a proud Jara man from central Victoria. Um, and I think that, Adam talked about it before. When I was awarded um, the fellowship, myself, the Churchill Trust, and I think my own organisation were concerned about he's a senior fire uh, and land manager who's not Aboriginal, studying something that's very um, keenly interested in with traditional owners. So I put to my organisation, if I was successful, we would fund separately Trent to come along, and we did. And uh, I think... For me personally, travelling with a traditional owner, getting to know Trent well, and we've become really close friends and our families. Uh, Trent now works um, in my organisation in a position that I've created as a senior uh, fire and cultural heritage practitioner, which is a new role. He was only made on ongoing very recently. But those relationships and that insight that I got into traditional owner views around cultural fire were, well, just frankly priceless. Um, so that was a real uh, highlight for me. Another Aboriginal man, Tim Kanoa, who was part of our self-determination self branch, also travelled with me. Um, uh, and, and again, long, long uh, term friendships being developed and just the insights and the relationship development between um, myself as a bureaucrat, really, and, and, and an insight into traditional own knowledge and what they want to do in this space um, was vital known to my understanding but my organisation's understanding. In fact, I was asked to give evidence at the Royal Commission into the bushfires um, in the summer season on behalf of Victoria for all agencies around my insights into how agencies could actually um, enable traditional owners uh, to uh, put cultural fire uh, on the landscape and, and manage country and what that meant. Next slide, please. Um, and another highlight was being in a place called Witchpeck in California. And I have to say, I can't do my trip justice in 10 minutes. I really can't. And someone might have to give me a one minute warning. Um, but th these are just a couple of real, there was probably about, you know, 50 highlights, honestly. But, but that's Tim Kanoa there, the, the other traditional owner I mentioned, um, and some other traditional owners from California. Uh, what was amazing to me was the similarities between the experience of, I guess, colonisation in America and Australia, the impacts that had on, on uh, traditional owners, specifically around management of land and how important that still is to traditional owners. Um, and the insight that fire wasn't the end game, it was more a tool of which they want to garden the landscape or manage country. So they were all, they sound pretty simple, but they're all extremely valuable um, insights and um, 
Leif Hillman that's there on the right, a huge man, uh, doesn't do him justice. But he said, collaboration is the key. We won't always agree, but we can focus on shared values. Healing the land and the people is very, very key. Um, and why I've highlighted that particular saying, and this is all in my report, which is available online, there is a lot of uh, mistrust between traditional owner groups and agencies such as mine, and that persists. And agencies like mine don't always understand that. So um, that's been a key learning that I've been able to bring back to our organisation and other agencies, um, in, in, certainly in Australia. Um, some other, uh, so what have I learned and achieved since returning to Australia? Um, like I said, I don't want to take credit for all of this, but a lot has happened in the, in the last few years. In 2017, uh, we did our first cultural burn on country supporting uh, the Jarrah uh, group in central Victoria, where in the area that I manage in, in Vic. Um, and that was the first cultural burn that was put back on country led by traditional owners in, to the best of our knowledge and their knowledge in 170 years. Um, in that intervening time, there have now another 30 plus traditional owner burns being uh, implemented or have been implemented um, with about six or seven different traditional owner groups and, and other, 120 other burns planned for the future. Um, there is now a traditional owner cultural fire strategy, which was funded but written by traditional owners. Uh, we have uh, self-determination strategies. And one of my key lessons back to the agency was, this is far more about enabling self-determination as a foundational principle than it is about land management. That's an outcome. Um, as I mentioned, I gave evidence to the Royal Commission, so hopefully that had some impact on influencing uh, nationwide strategies in this area. Um, and only very recently, uh, the Victorian State Government announced direct funding um, to traditional owner groups to the tune of about $20 million over the next four years, plus some ongoing money after that, which is something I've been recommending um, and others um, for for some time, but it's a huge step forward in self-determination. And as a result of that, a lot of traditional owners cite the work that we're doing in regards to cultural fire as a really good example of what real self-determination for Aboriginal people looks like. Um, next slide. So what's the best thing about being a Churchill Fellow? Um, by the way, that's Mick Burke, another traditional owner. Um, using that traditional sort of technique to apply fire in a cool landscape um, up, up in the north, up near the, the Murray River, not far from the Murray River. Um, I think the best thing about being a Churchill Fellow, it was mentioned earlier, is um, being part of that group, I can't say how inspiring that is, to, to be surrounded by people that are so passionate about such a broad group of um, issues um, and genuinely life committed to those issues. I, I, I find that um, as all of you who are passionate about something will know you have your ups and downs, your good times, your bad times. But I think that having that strength of that collective group, that esprit de corps is, is really important. I think the other really practical thing though, and uh, is just that additional credibility that being a Churchill fellow gives you, the doors that it's opened. I, I was asked um, a year and a half ago to go to New Zealand to talk at the first um, Native Indigenous Studies um, uh, a sort of lecture a series. Um, and I was one of the only non-Aboriginal or Native Americans um, that, that went to that. It was actually organised in New Zealand, but it was coming from North America. So those sorts of opportunities to influence policy within your agency and more broadly um, are amazing. And I did do the Policy Impact Program and, and being able to learn as a practitioner what are the levers that really count in policy and who to um, go to and how to influence those people has been really, really valuable to me and to my organisation. Um, my last bit of advice, just about um, one key bit of advice for applicants, it really is show your passion. Don't hold back. Um, I recall my first interview really well. I've, I was up in Sydney doing a course, flew back for the interview, I was tired. Uh, one, of, one of the panel members asked me, well, why would we send you? Why wouldn't we send me? And I remember saying something like, well, I've been doing this for 28 years. I probably know a little bit more about it than you. And I, I actually thought at that point I might have lucked out. But I think what I was really doing was um, showing my passion, um, it, it, showing that this meant something to me. So um, 
And I think the other thing is enjoy the process as well, regardless of whether you're selected or not. Um, there's a lot you will learn about your own uh, area of expertise. It'll really test you to see what you know public value you want to add in that area. Um, like I said, I could I could talk for probably um, two hours on this, but I'll leave it there and happy to go to Q and A. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Scott. That was that was fantastic. Um, so just before I get to the questions, I, I just want to mention um, you would have heard both. Taryn and Scott refer to uh, the policy impact program. So that's something we uh, are doing in partnership with the University of Queensland. And the, the purpose is to help our some of our Churchill Fellows. And it's a, an internal selection process, if you will, from our alumni each year um, who are trying to change policy, whether that's at a national or a state or a local level. And uh, if you have a look on our website, um, you'll see that. Uh, there's a few more strings to the Churchill Fellowship bow than you might realise. Um, you know, on your return, you can apply for some additional funding support to help you disseminate your findings and, and share your findings. Um, and you'll see that banner I've got in my Zoom background impact that says funding. Uh, we're now uh, piloting this year, next year, um, uh, making funding available to Churchill Fellows to uh, apply for to help them uh, implement their findings, to actually get rubber on the road with the things they're doing. And, and, and that's pretty exciting. And so when you think about it, a Churchill Fellowship uh, is so much more than, than the travel component now. Uh, we're really focused on how we can uh, support um, impact uh, from that investment. So I'll move on to the questions and Scott and Taryn, um, I'll call on you. Um, so you can put your cameras on if you want. Um, so I'll just go through the, them in order. So uh, can you apply for multiple project ideas? I, I guess I'll answer that in two ways. Um, you can only put one application in um, per year. So you can't put multiple applications in on different things. And if you've got one application and you've got multiple ideas, you're probably not gonna be successful. So you really need to be very clear on what it is that you wanna do because everyone else applying is gonna be really clear and kind of like a laser focused on what the issue is. That's not to say there'll be some things you don't know until you go overseas, that, that's expected, but um, you need to have a very clear idea. So I think pick your best, your strongest um, project idea, the thing that you're most passionate about. Scott mentioned that. Passion uh, is a word we, we throw around a lot, but it really means a lot um, for a Churchill Fellowship, particularly in the assessment process. Um, and the next question is uh, that we say in our, our online material, you need to have experience in the field. Is this true or can you apply on any topic if you can find a referee with experience in the field who agrees with your ideas? Again, look, if you don't have experience in that particular area, you're not gonna be awarded a fellowship because what we're looking for are people who have actually been chasing down a particular idea, working on something um, in an area for some time. And like I said, it doesn't have to relate to your work, but you need to be actively involved in it. We want someone you know, if you've got an idea now and you've got no experience, maybe go and, you know, get experience in that area, see what you can do with it, and then maybe in a few years apply for a church or fellowship. Um, can you propose travel to multiple countries? I think that's been answered through Taryn and Scott's uh, great presentations. So yes, just, just don't go overboard, make sure it's achievable. Um, and I think this question is to Taryn, have you managed to apply your learnings from your travel to the, your greater shire? Yeah, you might have written, that might have been written before the slide came up. I think so. But yes, so, so the, I guess the outcomes um, that I described were, were for across the whole shire. And in addition, we have um, a number of uh, external local government areas that are replicating our model as well. Yeah, so I think that impact is just like a wave that's rippling, you know, um, hopefully, each year, getting bigger. Um, what about how do you manage your stops or your interviews to allow for other options to emerge? Scott or Taryn, did you want to talk about how you did that? I, I, I'm happy to, to answer that. I, I had a, a guide of where I needed to be. <clears throat> I arrived and there was a huge storm event in America and everything got thrown out the window. So I, I was adapting the whole time. The nature of working with traditional owner groups is that they, they, they may agree to meet with you, and you might get there and then they, they, they may change arrangements. So there was a heap of flexibility in my, my program. So I, I changed things quite rapidly. 
and, and the Churchill Trust were fantastic with that. I hope that answers the question. Yep. Taryn, Taryn did you want to yeah. add to that? Uh, I, I would agree. I had a, a couple of um, variations to, to my travel because certain people couldn't meet or they recommended other people and it seemed more uh, relevant to, to, to go to a certain place. Um, so, yeah, I had some slight variations, again, that, um, that the trust was really accepting of. Excellent. So next question, with less than 10% chance of being selected or with a positive view, with a 10% chance of being selected, um, if you're unsuccessful this year, uh, can you reapply next year? Um, and how will you know how to improve your application? So yes, you, you can apply. Look, um, not everyone gets a fellowship on their first application. Some people get it on their second, uh, even third. I have heard, I've met someone that got it on their fourth. So you, you can um, reapply. And uh, it's a bit difficult because year on year, you've got a different field. So it's not the same people applying every year. So you could put the same application in the following year and get through to an interview, whereas you didn't the previous year. And that could be based on the field. It could be based on, you know, that the particular timing being just right, where your issue or topic is, is, is suddenly something that that, that year is much more, um, you know, in, in the public um, eye or, or seemingly more urgent. We um, obviously can't give individual detailed feedback to over a thousand people each year, but um, we do have on our website what we kind of kind of calling generic feedback. So we each year we update that with the kinds of things that we know the committees are saying people need to think about and look at. The other thing you can do is through our website, you can look up fellows um, who maybe are in similar areas to you, similar topics, um, and you can put a request in through the website to contact them and we'll facilitate that where possible. People like Taryn or Scott or others, I'm sure we'll be quite happy um, to have a chat with you about your application. We've also got alumni associations in each state and territory, and you can find them on the front page of a website. So there's lots of opportunities to talk to Churchill Fellows um, about, about what you might be able to improve on. Um, the next question is about, can we can't travel to higher risk countries, but what about countries that are generally low to moderate risk pre-COVID, um, but are currently listed as high, as high risk. Yeah, it is a strange time. So I think, you know, if you, you take the assumption that you won't, you won't be traveling till 2023 anyway, so let's assume that things get a bit more normal. Um, really think about, yeah, you know, what are those countries that you really need to go to and those people or those organizations and make that your priority. You might not be able to travel to them right now, um, but as you know, the world is opening up again. And I think make the assumption that things will be more normal by the time you travel. And then if things don't work out, you know, there's some flexibility to make some, some changes to your itinerary um, down the track. Um, next question is, have previous fellows used modes of transport other than flights? Um, absolutely. And climate impacts, that's a good, it's a good point. Um, and, and I would point out we've had people take uh, hire a car, but from a climate perspective, that might not be that good either compared to say a train, but Taryn's probably got some good answers here. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously I flew into Europe, but I primarily used train um, where I could and where it wasn't going to take too long and, and really extend the trip, but I, I did get a hire car, but I got a hybrid um, hire car, so it was, yeah, for as low emissions as I could as I could get and uh, yeah, use that, um, particularly for the rural small communities where there wasn't eas easily available um, train and buses to them. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you need to be a life learner in your area, in the area that you apply in, or can you be a newcomer to your area, uh, but you've been contributing, contributing, contributing to it another way? So, okay. For example, you've been working in emergency management, but want to work on climate change and there's a link or a nexus between the two. Yeah, I think that's fine. It's really up to you to think about um, that nexus and, and, and you know, your contribution and, and why it should be you and what networks and, and channels you have to share that knowledge when you get back. So I think if you can paint that picture of that connection and say, look, my strength in emergency management, my networks there uh, are very relevant and valid. And I think, you know, that I can bring that climate change angle or lens through that network. I think that'll be up to you to, to sell that. Um, uh, can I say more about the impact funding? Um, what is the definition of impact and what did the board have in mind when designing the new model? Um, well, look, effectively, um, the... Uh, 
I don't want to give a definition of impact that gets into muddy waters, but what we're really looking at for this pilot is a direct line of sight from a Churchill Fellows recommendation. So they come back from their fellowship and they um, uh, synthesize all the information and learnings and they, they invariably have recommendations. So this is how we could do this in Australia. So, you know, we should do this, this or this. Um, and so the idea is that someone applies for the impact funding uh, to allow them to implement one of those recommendations. So, you know, really um, tangible rubber on the road. So not for more research, but actually do something um, tangible. And for this pilot, we're asking for people who are, I guess, ready to implement um, and can do something over the next 12 months. So that, you know, we're helping people where they're at that tipping point of being able to um, implement um, or pilot um, or try out, you know, some of their recommendations in the real world, so to speak. So that's, that's what we've got in mind. It's actually, you know, pretty open at the moment where uh, I'm not wanting to limit the opportunities by putting in some sort of artificial, you know, limitations on what we mean by impact, but, you know, we've given guidance and uh, we've got some uh, exciting applications coming um, and we'll, we'll refine it as we go. So it's new ground for us, but I think it's really exciting and an important thing for us to be doing. Um, so another question on that, um, is it the funding available separate to the fellowship recipients? Um, well, it's only available to Churchill Fellows um, who've come back and, and written a report or, or whatever form that takes and, and um, you know, have continued to try and implement their, their recommendations. Um, next question is, if we wish to attend training, but the 2023 details are not available yet, could we base info on the application on previous? Yes, you can. I think just make sure you know that it's going to be offered. And look, there's been some things happen uh, where training where it's possible has gone virtual like this because, you know, travel's not been possible, COVID, et cetera. And some of our fellows have elected to, and we've let them undertake that training virtually as part of their fellowship. So we can be quite flexible there, but I think, yes, base it on what you know um, and, and take it from there. Um, if the project is socio-environmental, can we apply for this fellowship? Mm, the project I have in mind is very interdisciplinary. Does it mean it will be considered for the fellowship? Uh, there's no limits on the topic. So if it's multidisciplinary, if it's esoterical, if it's whatever, um, that's fine. We don't put limits on it. But your job is going to be to be very clear about what it is you're wanting to do and why you want to do it, why it should be you, and what the benefits will be to the community when you come back with those findings and you share those findings or those uh, skills or, or that knowledge. So you're going to have to do a really good job explaining clearly um, about your project. But, you know, I wouldn't say no to um, pretty much any idea people come up with. Um, and how specific is the field of project? So really, look, we've got eight categories that we use, um, you know, um, like education, arts, et cetera. And that's just to help us um, make sure that the, the selection panels are assessing uh, applications that they've got the most knowledge in. So I wouldn't get too hung up on that, that field issue, just focus on, you know, what your application's about. There is an age limit, so you have to be 18, otherwise no. And um, we do get applications from people, I think we've awarded a fellowship to uh, 78, might be the oldest person, if I've got that right. We've awarded four and a half thousand, so forgive me if I forget, but um, we're certainly encouraging applications from people from all age groups. Um, we would love to see younger people, we'd love to see older people. Um, you just need to be able to you know, demonstrate that you're, um, uh, passionate about the issue and that you're willing and able to come back and, and share that knowledge and, and do something with it and inspire, you know, others um, locally. Um, I talked about feedback, so no, we don't give detailed feedback, but we do um, try and collate the most common things um, that people need to improve. In the application uh, for deciding who you want to meet, do you just need to put the tentative names of organisations and people, or do you need to ensure they're available? So I think um, put down, yeah, the names of people you really do want to meet with. You don't need to have locked them in, um, but I would, you know, just be mindful or aware of if they are. So an organisation, for example, do they actually meet, let international visitors come? 
And that's something that you might want to just sort of sound out first. You don't have to say, I've contacted them, they're happy to meet with me. Some people do that. That's really up to you, but we don't expect you to go to that level of confirmation at that point. Um, we just expect you to be you know, aware of who uh, you want to meet with and why. Um, is it necessary to do the travel in one block? Um, so in this, the question in this case has two young children, it would be more feasible to do it in two shorter blocks. Um, look, really no, um, in the sense that um, it's really difficult for people to leave Australia and travel overseas um, once alone twice, just to you know, get that time to go away. And there's obviously a cost implication as well. Um, usually people get an around the world ticket. That's most common with Churchill Fellowships based on their itineraries. Um, so two weeks isn't very long. It's a lot of effort to go to. So we tend not to let people split the travel. I think if it was, you know, uh, New Zealand um, for a week or something like that, you know, we might be able to consider it. We have had examples um, where, where people have had their travel interrupted due to maybe, you know, uh, a, a tragedy in the family, an illness. We've had someone uh, go skiing halfway through their fellowship and break their leg. That was unfortunate. Um, and it's proven to be really difficult for people to find that time to go back. And that big break between your, your project um, work it can be quite difficult for people to kind of pull it all together. Um, on that note, actually, of, of, you know, you're welcome to work a holiday in if you want to fund um, some extra time away. Um, we recommend you do that after you've done all your research or if you have a break sort of in the middle that you don't do anything that's going to risk um, you breaking a leg or something like that because that is a real challenge for, for you to get back out again. Uh, can you apply for a project in a related field, but not one you have direct experience in? So in this example, the person has experience in public transport and rail freight, but wants to look into the supply chain of hydrogen and CO2 sequestration and how that will affect rail transport. And look, it really, um, there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, you know, you just need to be able to um, demonstrate why you should be doing it. You know, so if you if you can convince um, the selection committee that you what you're wanting to uh, explore with your fellowship is significant, it's important, it's going to benefit the community, and that you are the right person to do it, um, then you know, then you'll be you'll be fine. Um, there's no reason not to consider it. As I said before, your project and your application does not need to relate to your um, employment um, at all. Um, do you need to return to Australia immediately at the end of the trip? And where is the written report published? Um, good question. So we do expect you to return to Australia. That's you know, important for you to come back and do things here. But you, know, you don't have to return immediately if you want to uh, you know, meet your family or um, get them to travel and meet you or you've got family overseas or you just want to take a break. Um, that's okay. And you're already halfway around the world. Um, you can save some money by extending the, the trip um, that's perfectly fine if it's just you know a, a couple of weeks or a few weeks but um, if you're sort of thinking you're going to disappear for a year or something we might not think that's the best outcome um, so I wouldn't plan to do that if I was you um, where is the written report published so if you go to our website um, all of the reports that we received are all um, available online um, each church fellow has a profile page uh, with information about them and what their report was about and a PDF um, of the report. Um, we do have some uh, flexibility in terms of written reports as well. We've, we've now seen a video report and a podcast report um, provided with a, you know, a summary document to go with it. So if you think that's a, a great way to communicate your findings, you can do that as well. Um, if you have a look at um, uh, Taryn support, for example, she... Um, had, had, I think, if I remember correctly, how and access some of our post fellowship dissemination support. And her report is beautifully graphic designed and laid out. And a lot of fellows are doing that now, where it's useful to have a, a physical document to hand out. You know, you might be meeting with a minister or a council or at, a, at an event. Um, and so that, that's another thing people do with their reports. But they're all available um, online. So, on that note, oh, one more question. Um, do all shortlisted applicants get interviewed? Uh, 
online or face-to-face? -face? How is it arranged? Good question. So yes, so uh, if you're shortlisted, um, it's a little bit different um, in different states and territories due to the volume of applications. So in New South Wales and Victoria, how it works is the um, there are selection panels which are based on um, you know education, health, people with you know experience in those areas, arts, whatever it might be, and they'll do an initial uh, shortlisting process, and then people who are shortlisted will be interviewed as a first round interview, and then from that people will again be shortlisted for a second round or final interview by the broader um, selection committee, which will comprise a person from each of those panels. In the smaller states, um, there's a shortlisting process by the committee and then interviews by the committee. So if you do make it to interview, in particular the second interview in Victoria or New South Wales, that's a pretty significant achievement because it is very competitive. Um, and you know a large number of people that get interviewed will get a fellowship. So if you make it that far, you've done, you've done very well. Um, there's a preference uh, for face-to-face -face interviews. Um, I think that's sort of inherent in the whole uh, you know, the ethos behind the church with fellowships, like meeting someone face to face, you can you can draw a lot more out than you can over a video. That said, um, we were in the middle of a round in 2020 when COVID hit, all of our interviews were done virtually and they went they went pretty well, I've got to say. You know, that they, they went really well. So if um, there's a reason that you can't get to an interview, they're held in the capital cities. I think a good reason is you live, you know, 300 kilometers away. And that's a bit of a challenge. Um, getting there just for a, for a 15, 20 minute interview, then uh, I think, you know, we could ex make some exceptions for video. Um, most people like to do the face-to-face -face interview if they can, but we can be flexible. Um, if selected, will the trust assist with graphic design? I may have missed that, sorry, question when I was answering before. So you can apply for um, dissemination funding to design your report. If, if that's um, what you want to do. You can also apply for assistance, maybe with airfares, getting to a conference where you're going to speak about your church or fellowship findings as well. There's a range of different things you can do. So it's 1.30. I want to thank um, everyone for attending and those who've stayed on the line. Thank you to Scott and Taryn for sharing your insights and experiences. That was amazing. And if you're applying for a fellowship, uh, good luck. Thank you.